All right, well, welcome everyone to another edition of the Unpredictable Pipeline. In this series, we are interviewing marketing leaders uh, who have been leading their organization, leading their teams, in many cases, leading their industry through 2020, where at the beginning of the year, we may have had plenty of goals and go-to-market strategies to create a predictable pipeline for organizations, and then 2020 had a different ideas. And I'm very happy to have as our guest for this, this edition, Charles Gold. He is the Chief Marketing Officer for Firemon. And, and Charles, you had the unique distinction of joining the company literally at the beginning of this year. So you joined in January of 2020, and then less than two months later, you know what hits the fan. Talk a little bit about what that was like, sort of going in, having a plan, having thought about like this great first year you wanted to have as the, as the CMO, and then all of a sudden, you know, the world had different ideas. Yeah, so it was definitely a roller coaster. Um, you know, what I tell people when they ask me how the job is going is I say it's awesome, having a great time, making a difference, completely different than the job I signed up for at the beginning of the year. Um, so, so yeah, I had, I had, um, I had just sort of gotten my bearings in the organization, um, you know, figured out where I could go to get a soda and that sort of thing when, uh, when the world turned upside down. Um, so we did, we did make some, some pretty big adjustments, uh, to roll with the punches. And I know, I mean, like a lot of companies that meant, you know, the budget that you thought you were going to have for the year got cut pretty significantly. Um, and you know, what were some of the things with less money, but still with pipeline to generate and even perhaps even more important to see what can marketing contribute to make sure we can hit our number. What were some of the things that you took the money you had left, the resources you had left, where did you focus? Yeah, so it's a great question. So there's a couple of pieces to it. So first off, one of the pieces of strategy that I had begun to put in place before all this happened is I wanted to lean in far more heavily into digital for customer acquisition. And I wanted to lean in far uh, more heavily into ABM or what we call ABX, right? Um, Cause I can't base everything. And so in a way, um, the world getting turned upside down pushed us harder and faster in those directions, maybe with less resources than we would have liked ideally, um, but it certainly accelerated our timeline. Um, so, so uh, do you want me to start that at the top? If you want to, that's fine. No, I was li literally, so this is, this is the work from home mentality. Right? But thankfully not doing this live, but I kicked my kids off of the TV down here. They put it on pause and the pause just expired 20 seconds ago. So unless you want to listen to Pokemon <laughs> episodes while we do this. Um, I, yeah. I'm, all, I'm all good. My kids are older than that. That's all gone by the wayside. So let's, uh, let's start that again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, that's yeah, fine. Well, at least you didn't have to listen to it. But yeah, I think, you know, I appreciated that you didn't call it ABM. I appreciate you called it ABX. I think, you know, account based is more than just marketing and maybe talk about what that also meant in terms of, how you created alignment, not just between marketing and sales, but sort of use this opportunity to think about alignment between sales, the BDR team, the channel, sort of more of the customer facing ecosystem to have a focus on your target accounts. Yeah, totally. So did, did you want me to answer the first question you do want to use what you had for that? I think I got what I got. Yeah, it's fine. Before I get into this. Yeah, it's fine. All right, cool. Yeah. Um, so, so, um, so with regard to, <coughs> <clears throat> excuse me, account-based in particular, you know, what, what we learned, um, and I think it's probably generalizable to lots of companies, is, you know, when people start talking about account-based, they start sort of falling in love with all the technologies that can enable it, and, you know, there's all kinds of ad server technologies and predictive technologies and all these sorts of things, which are wonderful. Um, but it's really about the foundation is the ground game. It's about having sales and BDRs and channel working closely together to drive pipeline uh, and to drive customer relationships. So one of the first things we put in place is a biweekly cadence um, between, uh, there's a, a marketing person who sort of served as the coach, an account, uh, account executive, a field account executive, um, who would be the quarterback, mm -hmm. the BDR, um, the uh, channel account manager, and then over time, also the customer success manager for a given patch um, or a given set of accounts. Mm -hmm. And they would meet bi-weekly to really strategize how they were going to go after those accounts, whether those were installed-based accounts, 
in which case we, we'd oftentimes leverage customer success to get some more knowledge of the account um, or whether that was Greenfield. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we could call a play where the BDR would do certain things, the field rep would do certain things, marketing would do certain things, the BDR would do certain things in a way that, you know, we really drove that collaboration. And once we did that for a few weeks and they started seeing results and pipeline build from that focus and that collaboration, then it was very easy for us to say, hey, cool. Now we're going to layer in some more technology. We're going to layer in, you know, greater use of Sendoza for sending gifts, or we're going to layer in uh, Sixth Sense for predictive and for ad serving and that sort of thing. But by that point, people were already used to the motion mm -hmm. and putting the technology on top was like, oh, we love ABX. And now you're going to make it better mm -hmm. versus, hey, I've got some technology for you, yeah. right? I'm going to clutter up your Salesforce screen with more stuff. So one of the key lessons learned uh, for me and for our team is the importance of that ground game and sort of setting the foundation um, so that you can then have an effective program that, that can scale. Yeah, no, I think that's important. I think, uh, you know, I heard someone this morning in this series talk about sort of the hierarchy of having strategy first, structure second, people third. And I think there, you know, you could say people in that category. Can you hear me? Say technology in that category. Um, and I think you're seeing a lot of the same kind of things. Um, you know, one of the other things, Charles, that you mentioned in, in, our, in our discussion before was the issue of honing your message and getting a little tighter on what the message was to the market, um, especially given sort of the tighter buying conditions a lot of your prospects uh, may be seeing. Talk a little bit about that process of honing your message and, and the outcome that that represented for you as well. Yeah, so, so this was another big deal. And again, this was something that I had come in and said, look, we need a sharper message. You know, the phrase I kept using with the team is we need sharper elbows in the market. Um, mm -hmm. We need to be a lot more aggressive. Um, what this year really did for us is it, it really put a really tight lens around ROI, financial return, mm -hmm. tangible benefits. Um, and so we went back to a lot of our old case studies and, and, and to some of the customers who had gotten returns from us and, and really dug deep on what those returns were so that we could then externalize them on our website, in our marketing materials, in our sales materials, so that we're not talking to a customer about feature function benefit exclusively. We're starting with understanding their business need. Mm -hmm and then explain to them the kinds of return on their investment that they could get with our product suite. And then you can start talking about how you're gonna achieve them. Right. It's a different way of selling, it's a different way of marketing, but today when <coughs> there's a big line of people waiting for a check in front of the CFO's door, um, you know, being able to talk in terms that speak to cost savings or efficiency gains, huge, absolutely huge. Yeah. Yeah, I think especially um, and, and COVID really sort of forced us into the position to do it faster. Yeah. And I think especially right now when we're seeing companies start to spend money, but spend money on fewer things, you know, where it used to be yeah. maybe priorities number four or five would get some dollars. Now priorities one or two are the real focus as companies put a heightened focus on what should be number one and two and making sure that those things, those smaller numbers of bets get funding, at least for the time being. Um, I think last question for you, Charles, so I appreciate you doing this. I think it's just a, real, a little more personal question. I promise you said I could ask whatever I wanted and this isn't too personal, uh, but I think just, you know, we've all been like in, in, addi in addition to, you know, just the, you're navigating this new role, um, you know, in your first year on the job, just dealing with the pandemic in general, like what's something that you miss uh, from January from just eight months ago that you're excited to get back to once we can get back to normal a little bit. And what's maybe something that you don't miss um, that you realize now is does not need to be part of your new normal moving forward? So I'd really like to go sit in a restaurant and have a nice meal. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, we, we do a lot of cooking here and it's a lot of fun. Um, I like to cook, that's all super cool. Uh, my wife's a great cook, love all that. Uh, but it'd be nice for us to be able to go out for a meal Mm -hmm. um, we've been pretty hunkered down. We've been pretty conservative about this whole thing. So we haven't done that. I, I, I definitely miss that. Yeah. Um, in terms of things that I don't miss, I was on an airplane. I'm, I'm based in DC. My company's based in Dallas. I was on an airplane every single week. Mm -hmm. um, 
I don't miss that. I don't miss the backache from being in, you know, a middle seat on a, on a late night flight. Um, I don't miss sleeping in, uh, you know, in the Marriott as opposed to my own bed. Um, and I think I'll be doing less of that when we get to the other side of this. Yeah. yeah I think it's, it's interesting how many, you know, a lot of marketing leaders that aren't in the location of their headquarters that, you know, uh, sort of now have been forced not to do that, you know, Sunday night flight out and Thursday night flight back. And, um, you know, ha have you guys sort of rethought what sort of work means for Firemon now in terms of, you know, whether people need to be together, whether, you know, different time zones need to connect. Um, as, you, as you guys start to think about returning to work, have you thought about that for your team as well as for the organization overall? Yeah, I mean, I think the big, so for me, I've managed remote teams, like globally distributed teams, oftentimes when I wasn't in the headquarters location for almost my entire career. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm very comfortable with that. Um, Firemon, I don't think was as comfortable with that. I think we've gotten to a place where most people now are seeing the benefits of remote and of distributed teams. Um, all of the roles, I'm hiring for a few marketing roles right now. I don't care where the people are. Um, just three or four months ago, we would have said, you know, we would have put a hard requirement that they're in one of our office locations. Yeah. Now we just want the best possible talent wherever they are. Yeah. They have the internet. We're good. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting to, to watch that evolution. So Rich Barton, who, you know, founded, founded Expedia, was one of the founders of Zillow. And he's kind of famous for not really liking work from home. He liked people being in the office. And, you know, he's back as the CEO of Zillow now, and he's, he's been one of the most liberal now and saying, listen, like, we're going to work from home at least till spring next year, and then we'll, we'll see from there. Because I think he's realized that, you know, you've, you, you, you're able to give people a level of flexibility and freedom. If they can still be productive, they do it a little more on their terms. You save some money in office costs along the way. As a publicly traded company, that's not necessarily a bad part of it as well. So I don't know. We'll figure it all out. But um, thank you so much, Charles, for doing this today. Uh, thank you for sharing some of your insights and ideas, and thanks for being part of the Unpredictable Pipeline. Cool. Yeah, it was my pleasure. Thanks very much for including me, and let me know if I can ever be helpful in the future. Thank you.